The Greatest Ever Bank Robbery. The Collapse of the Savings and Loan Industry. October 1, 1990 by Martin Mayer. Traces the events, policies, and players in the savings and loan scandal, exposing the duplicity of thrift operators, lawyers, and politicians, and criticizing current plans for reform of the banking system. Mayor the bankers here sounds a roaring indictment of grand thievery in the deregulated savings and loan industry, for which taxpayers are being billed billions in restitution costs for scores of S and L failures. Citing Charles H. Keating's Lincoln S and L among many others, Mayer not only denounces enormous profits based on federal deposit insurance, but suggests that members of Congress, bank regulators, Wall Street investment bankers, and top accounting and legal firms condoned the pyramiding of speculative, overvalued, and even non-existent assets all in return for campaign contributions, huge fees, and self-perpetuating commissions. Names are named and nuts and bolts revealed, but the book's greatest virtue at times becomes its only drawback. The numbingly detailed intricacies and blatant knavery of each case history is almost beyond comprehension. This popular business and financial writer The Bankers, LJ2175, has done extensive research to provide an up-to-date and very readable account of the savings and loan industry debacle. Like several other authors who have written on this during the past year, Mayer traces what happened and documents the activities of key personalities, however, Mayer's book is distinguished by his pertinent questions regarding the impact of the debt both in general and on the future of the industry itself, and his account of current activities of government agencies, such as the newly formed Resolution Trust Corporation. A timely book that will most likely be in demand at public libraries. A noted progressive writer summarizes the $50 billion scandal. Martin Mayer, born 1928, is a scholar at the Brookings Institution, as well as the author of many other books such as The Bankers. The Next Generation. The Fed. The inside story of how the world's most powerful financial institution drives the market's nightmare on Wall Street. Salomon Brothers and the Corruption of the Marketplace, etc. Note. Page numbers below refer to the 366-page paperback edition. He wrote in the first chapter of this 1990 book, the theft from the taxpayer by the community that fattened on the growth of the savings and loan S and L industry in the 1980s is the worst public savings scandal in American history. Teapot Dome in the Harding administration and Credit Mobilier in the times of Ulysses S. Grant have been taken as the ultimate horror stories of capitalist democracy gone to seed. Measuring by money, by the misallocation of national resources, or by the extent of the disgrace to prominent individuals and important professional groups, the S&L outrage makes Teapot Dome and Credit Mobilier seem minor episodes. Page 1, he adds, the S&L story is desperately important because we must ask whether our great professions are still capable of self-regulation of giving honest service and of accepting fiduciary duties in an age when all costs and benefits are reduced to monetary measurements and all conduct that is not specifically prohibited has become permissible, we must ask whether this generation of Americans remains capable of self-government. Page 28. He observes, even insiders in the S&L disaster have little sense of how much damage was done by the consequent eruption of Wall Street into the little world of the S&Ls. The debilitation of the industry is in large part the result of its contact with a more intelligent, more sophisticated, more amnesiac, more mechanical, more predatory form of life. Page 74. Bank board regulator named Ed Gray incessantly warned the world about what was happening, and time and again, he tried to stop the abuse of the peculiar rules that defined legality in the operation of an S and L. If he couldn't stop the spread of zombie thrifts, he at least slowed their growth. With absolutely no help from Congress and with a legal staff never confident of the board's authority, living constantly with the feat that the truth might spark an unmanageable run on the bank with incalculable consequences, Gray kept riding the tiger. Page 125. The Keating Five were five United States senators accused of corruption in 1989, igniting a major political scandal as part of the larger savings and loan crisis of the late 1980s and early 1990s. The five senators. Alan Cranston, Democrat of California. Dennis DeConcini, Democrat of Arizona. John Glenn, Democrat of Ohio. John McCain, Republican of Arizona. And Donald W. Regal Jr., Democrat of Michigan. 
were accused of improperly intervening in 1987 on behalf of Charles H. Keating Jr., chairman of the Lincoln Savings and Loan Association, which was the target of a regulatory investigation by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, FHLBB. The FHLBB subsequently backed off taking action against Lincoln. Lincoln Savings and Loan collapsed in 1989, at a cost of $3.4 billion to the federal government and their taxpayers. Some 23,000 Lincoln bondholders were defrauded and many investors lost their life savings. The substantial political contributions Keating had made to each of the senators, totaling $1.3 million, attracted considerable public and media attention. After a lengthy investigation, the Senate Ethics Committee determined in 1991 that Cranston, DeConcini and Regal had substantially and improperly interfered with the FHLBE's investigation of Lincoln savings, with Cranston receiving a formal reprimand. Senators Glenn and McCain were cleared of having acted improperly, but were criticized for having exercised poor judgment. All five senators served out their terms. Only Glenn and McCain ran for re-election, and they both retained their seats. McCain would go on to run for President of the United States twice, and was the Republican Party nominee in 2008. McCain was the last senator remaining in his office before his death in August 2018. The U.S. savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and early 1990s was the failure of 747 savings and loan associations, S and LS, in the United States. The ultimate cost of the crisis is estimated to have totaled around $160.1 billion, about $124.6 billion of which was directly paid for by the U.S. federal government. The accompanying slowdown in the finance industry and the real estate market may have been a contributing cause of the 1990-1991 economic recession. Between 1986 and 1991, the number of new homes constructed per year dropped from 1.8 million to 1 million, at the time the lowest rate since World War II. The Keating Five scandal was prompted by the activities of one particular savings and loan. Lincoln Savings and Loan Association of Irvine, California. Lincoln's chairman was Charles Keating, who ultimately served five years in prison for his corrupt mismanagement of Lincoln. In the four years after Keating's American Continental Corporation, ACC, had purchased Lincoln in 1984, Lincoln's assets had increased from $1.1 billion to $5.5 billion. Such savings and loan associations had been deregulated in the early 1980s, allowing them to make highly risky investments with their depositors' money. Keating and other savings and loan operators took advantage of this deregulation. Savings and loans established connections to many members of Congress by supplying them with needed funds for campaigns through legal donations. Lincoln's particular investments took the form of buying land, taking equity positions in real estate development projects, and buying high-yield junk bonds. Corruption Allegations The core allegation of the Keating Five affair is that Keating had made contributions of about $1.3 million to various U.S. senators, and he called on those senators to help him resist U.S. federal regulators. The regulators did back off to later disastrous consequences. Beginning in 1985, Edwin J. Gray, chair of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, FHLBB, feared that the savings industry's risky investment practices were exposing the government's insurance funds to huge losses. Gray instituted a rule whereby savings associations could hold no more than 10% of their assets and direct investments, and were thus prohibited from taking ownership positions in certain financial entities and instruments. Lincoln had become burdened with bad debt resulting from its past aggressiveness, and by early 1986, its investment practices were being investigated and audited by the FHLBB in particular, whether it had violated these direct investment rules, Lincoln had directed Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insured accounts into commercial real estate ventures. By the end of 1986, the FHLBB had found that Lincoln had $135 million in unreported losses and had surpassed the regulated direct investments limit by $600 million. Keating had earlier taken several measures to oppose Gray and the FHLBB, including recruiting a study from then-private economist Alan Greenspan, saying that direct investments were not harmful, and getting President Ronald Reagan to make a recess appointment of a Keating ally, Atlanta real estate developer Lee H. Henkel Jr., to an open seat on the FHLBB. By March 1987, however, Henkel had resigned, upon news of his having large loans due to Lincoln. 
Meanwhile, the Senate had changed control from Republican to Democratic during the 1986 congressional elections, placing several Democratic senators in key positions, and starting in January 1987, Keating's staff was putting pressure on Cranston to remove Gray from any FHLBB discussion regarding Lincoln. The following month, Keating began large-scale contributions into Cranston's project to increase California voter registration. In February 1987, Keating met with Regal and began contributing to Regal's 1988 re-election campaign. It appeared as though the government might seize Lincoln for being insolvent. The investigation was, however, taking a long time. Keating was asking that Lincoln be given a lenient judgment by the FHLBB so that it could limit its high-risk investments and get into the safe, at the time, home mortgage business, thus allowing the business to survive. A letter from audit firm Arthur Young & Company bolstered Keating's case that the government investigation was taking a long time. Keating now wanted the five senators to intervene with the FHLBB on his behalf. By March 1987, Regal was telling Gray that some senators out west are very concerned about the way the bank board is regulating Lincoln savings, adding, I think you need to meet with the senators. You'll be getting a call. Keating and Deconcini were asking McCain to travel to San Francisco to meet with regulators regarding Lincoln savings, McCain refused. Deconcini told Keating that McCain was nervous about interfering. Keating called McCain a wimp behind his back, and on March 24, Keating and McCain had a heated contentious meeting. On April 2, 1987, a meeting with Gray was held in Deconcini's Capitol office, with Senators Cranston, Glenn, and McCain also in attendance. The senators requested that no staff be present. Deconcini started the meeting with a mention of Offrend at Lincoln. Gray told the assembled senators that he did not know the particular details of the status of Lincoln savings and loan, and that the senators would have to go to the bank regulators in San Francisco that had oversight jurisdiction for the bank. Gray did offer to set up a meeting between those regulators and the senators. On April 9, 1987, a two-hour meeting with three members of the FHLBB San Francisco branch was held, again in Deconcini's office, to discuss the government's investigation of Lincoln. Present were Cranston, Deconcini, Glenn, McCain, and additionally Regal. The regulators felt that the meeting was very unusual, and that they were being pressured by a united front, as the senators presented their reasons for having the meeting. Deconcini began the meeting by saying, We wanted to meet with you because we have determined that potential actions of yours could injure a constituent. McCain said, One of our jobs as elected officials is to help constituents in a proper fashion. ACC American Continental Corporation is a big employer and important to the local economy. I wouldn't want any special favors for them. I don't want any part of our conversation to be improper. Glenn said, to be blunt, you should charge them or get off their backs, while Deconcini said, what's wrong with this if they're willing to clean up their act? It's very unusual for us to have a company that could be put out of business by its regulators. The regulators then revealed that Lincoln was under criminal investigation on a variety of serious charges, at which point McCain severed all relations with Keating. The San Francisco regulators finished their report in May 1987 and recommended that Lincoln be seized by the government due to unsound lending practices. Gray, whose time as chair was about to expire, deferred action on the report, saying that his adversarial relationship with Keating would make any action he took seem vindictive, and that instead the incoming chair should take over the decision. Meanwhile, Keating filed a lawsuit against the FHLBB, saying it had leaked confidential information about Lincoln. The new FHLBB chair was M. Danny Wall, who was more sympathetic to Keating and took no action on the report, saying its evidence was insufficient. Tracho pa' 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 que estoy bien al top Me estoy craviendo a su grab Me está moteniendo al top In the dark room we fight Make up for our love I've been thinking, thinking about you About us I'm moving slow Our hearts beat so fast I've been dreaming, dreaming about you Hey! Hey! Hey!
dark room we fight Make up for our love I've been thinking, thinking about you About us I'm moving slow Our hearts beat so fast I've been dreaming, dreaming about you Together, we're invited to laugh at the characters. It is burning my eyes, but I cannot look away. L to the OG. A lot of the humor in the show comes from playing with tension and release, setup and punchline. One of the ways to make things tense is to create loaded pauses, to stretch out a moment and really build the tension. This is, you can. Wow. Well, oh, for fuck's sake, Dad, just tell him it's going to be me. This is where editing comes in. Taking two lines in a script and expanding time between them. If you need a leak, piss in a bucket. Filling the space with silence and awkward reactions. We're locking down. It's all right, we're all pals here. Yeah. Right. Jesus Christ, Ray, I'm pulling your pisser. Put that bucket down, you disgusting bastard. But tension is not just awkwardness. It can also come from intensity, from spitfire conversations and streams of insults. The kind of stuff Succession's made of. I have thoughts, but continue. For the magic to happen, you need a killer script and electric performances. But you can go a step further. You can shape the speed and rhythm of the conversation in the edit. By removing the natural gaps and overlapping performances, you bring the dialogue closer together. Like here. You? No. Uh, well, I mean... No, she thinks you're a dipshit. Or maybe you're just too much of a fucking dipshit to see that. Fuck you. I know more about this business than you. More than any of you, actually. Roman, no one gives a fuck about management training. Dad does. Jerry does. It's corporate daycare. What's up with dip here? <laughs> that's not a good retort. Don't fucking laugh at that. Shiv. Thanks for taking this seriously. I do. So that's expanding and contracting time. All to prepare for the release. In succession, release often comes from reaction shots. The jokes are often played out on the face of the victim, rather than who's speaking. He's got you eating fucking humiliation gumbo on TV, and then what? We rarely get uninterrupted shots of characters saying their lines. The show pays a lot of attention to getting everyone's take on what's being said. But then what about you two? Oh, you mean us having a yeah. baby? No, we're not planning to have a baby because that would require us having sex. Whoa. Sometimes the reaction is the punchline. Hey, Gregory Hirsch, is that someone known to you, Mr. Wamsgans? Uh, no, no, sorry. No? No? No, Tom? Succession is a show about putting wealthy people in small rooms and getting them to discuss business mergers and acquisitions. Time for the real meeting. <laughs> it might not seem like the most cinematic of premises, 
but the show knows how to make it engaging. We all like this? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Part of the charm are the rooms themselves, the confined spaces. It's the dinner tables, fancy meeting rooms, and some more tables. Proximity creates friction. And in the case of the yacht, there's an added bonus of not being able to leave. Good point. Good uh, observation. Sometimes those spaces are the source of jokes themselves. This is, this is the safe room, okay? This is the panic room. We're what? Safe here. What? How is it safe? Calm it's down. It's just a room. But it's mostly what you do in those spaces that's interesting. One of the many things the director does is block the scene. Plan out the movement of the characters. And when you've got a limited space to work with, Blocking becomes extra important. And just like everything in succession, blocking is about power. Take this scene, for example. The cruise line scandal breaks out and the company is trying to come up with a response. It starts off with Logan removing himself from the conversation. He's facing away from his advisors. He takes everything they say as a personal attack. Jerry and Roman are on the other side of the room. They're not the real players here. The actual conflict is in the middle. Shiv is towering over Kendall and trying to push her solution. Logan is fed up and thinks this is all bullshit. He comes back in the middle and sits down. He doesn't think the situation is important enough. No one real gives a fuck. Kendall uses the moment and takes Logan's spot. He takes over the role of a leader. I think we need to loudly and quickly say that this is not okay. And now that he's standing up, he's on equal footing with Shiv. As the conflict between Kendall and Shiv escalates, Logan can't take it anymore. Condemn and move on. He stands up, and now in the middle of the room, he's the center of attention. He is the one who calls the shots. This seemingly simple scene is choreographed like a battle. Each tactical movement highlights the ever-changing power dynamics. With constantly shifting alliances and failed rocket launches, one of the themes of the show is instability. Cinematography reflects that, with the shaky handheld style, constant reframing, and snap zooms. Often the show will utilize wider angles to show us the whole picture, the whole performance, including body language. And sometimes body language says more than words can. How I look and how I'm getting up and everything is off the record, okay? Thank you, ma'am. Especially when the characters don't even know what they're talking about. You know, Scooby do it, Dad. Part of the fun of the show is feeling like you're in on a joke deciphering what the characters are saying to get the true meaning. Shout out to Rhea for planning a wonderful funeral. I mean, uh, memorial. No, uh, evening. Because speaking your mind is not encouraged in the Royce household. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Like... Come on, we're all pals here. Let's oh, fucking yeah. have it out. Unless it's to put someone down. Ken nailed it. Thanks. Ken did great. It's Tom who farted in his shit. But there's more to succession than just a string of savage and sometimes pretty niche put downs. You look like a divorce attorney from the Twin Cities. It's partly the walk. It's like a real robot. Ag no, agricultural. <laughs> looks so hey, like Shiv, fuck off. Because succession is a drama. And when it hits, it hits hard. Okay, let's go. Hey, Dad. Do you think I should maybe say something to them? It's a dysfunctional family. I love you, I do. I just, uh, I wonder if... I wonder if the sad I'd be without you would be less than the sad I get from being with you. Succession is the only show that can take a broken man from this. Uh, pretty good. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're pretty close, so... That's how we are. To this. The truth is that my father is a malignant presence, a bully and a liar. And from Greg to Egg. Hi, 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 I'm involved in a criminal conspiracy. To a fucking whistleblower. Succession's a triumph of sharp writing and even sharper editing. Uh, if it is to be said, so it be, so it is. A show that treats executive level business like a battlefield and highlights the ridiculous with his camera work. With each element of the craft working perfectly in sync to bring to life the family you love to hate. Watching you people melt down is the most deeply satisfying. So hyper decant your mellow, grab some juicy morsels, and get hooked again.